We're going to talk about the development of nationality in American history today, or American government, and see how we ended up being something different. Why is the United States different than England? Okay. A lot of reasons for this. The biggest one is our Constitution. Our Constitution is unique in the world, okay? The basic definition of a Constitution is that it is the fundamental law of the land. However, Constitutions can have two different natures. You can have a written Constitution or an unwritten Constitution. Most of the world's Constitutions are unwritten. Now, what that means is, if you were in, like, England, and you went there and said, I'd like to see our Constitution, they wouldn't know what to give you. Because their Constitution is the collection of all the laws they've ever passed in the history of England. It would take a palace to hold all the laws. Our Constitution, you could read it in one sitting. It's only been changed 27 times. It's a very simple, fundamental law of the land. It's our most basic rules. Now we have laws that are passed on top of that, uh, that, that, that go into the minutiae and the detail of how we do things, okay? But our Constitution is broad scoping, okay? It's kind of like our morals, and it's like the outline of what we basically believe. And then we have laws that, 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 that fill it up. Think of the Constitution like a file cabinet and the laws being the things you put inside it. Okay. So, how did we end up with a unified government? First off, Americans have a unique character. You need to make sure you get this written down. How is our character unique from all other countries? If you've ever been to another country, you will see quickly that we are something special. Now, I don't know if that's good or bad, but you can spot the American from a mile away in any country. Okay? What are some characteristics that we have? Wait. Patriotic. <laughs> Very patriotic. We wear our red, white, and blue everywhere. Uh, if you're from the South, you wear your cowboy boots everywhere. And that identifies you as an American almost immediately. Uh, we also take up space. Is that a bad joke? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, we're, not, we're not the baddest nation in the world. We're close. Mexico beats us. But, uh, but we are, uh, but we, we do take up a lot of space. If you ever watch Americans, we are broad. When we sit, we spread out. When we have. Uh, we are a different kind. If you go to most nations of the world, people stay very close to themselves. So we're something different. And there's a lot of reasons for this. One is our isolationism from England. We were cut off from Mother England. So we're going to evolve in a different way over a couple of hundred years than they did. We're also going to have a different military experience than the people in England did. England was, at this point, still doing that uh, Napoleonic-style warfare, where they would get in lines with a drum and a fife corps that would, that would bang the drums, and they would march in in lines and shoot at each other across the field. That's how they fought wars. Like, to this day, do they still do it like that? We did all the way through World War II. Well, because, like, when I think of, like, England and their, like, fighting, that's how it Right, they're very a lot of our wars are still that way. The, the broad scope is still people in line marching in. But we didn't fight our war that way because we learned to fight fighting the American Indians who hid behind rocks and up in trees and shot at us. They developed this idea of guerrilla warfare. And that means that we're going to use that strategy a lot. We're going to fight a totally different kind of war than they are. We're not going to put our people in pretty uniform for you to see us. <laughs> We're going to hide behind trees. Um, the influence of the frontier. The fact that we, we had all this land to test ourselves against is what makes us unique. 
there's a guy named Frederick Jackson Turner, who's one of the greatest historians of all time. If any of you go on to study history in college, you'll have to read Frederick Jackson Turner's Frontier Thesis. And he argued that the reason why Americans were different was because the rest of the world was tamed, and we were untamed. We were a wild frontier and had to constantly test ourselves against it. Uh, and that made us very individualistic. That did not make us team players. Mm -hmm. And we're still very individualistic. Americans like to be, uh, mm -hmm. like, like, like to think of themselves as, as something different. I always think about the difference being, think about American sports versus European sports. Now, a lot of, a lot of us are football fans and we like teams. But if you're a soccer fan, soccer fans love soccer clubs. They support a club. Americans, we might support a team, but when we talk about it, we're going to talk about a player. It's a player we like. You know, it, 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 it's an individual. That's kind of, kind of that individual idea there, okay? We are still that way. Uh, Self-determined and egalitarian. We're also, as far as religion goes, because a bunch of different religions came to the United States, we're going to have a toleration for all Christian faiths. Now, notice at this point I'm not saying religious freedom, because we didn't have religious freedom. You were not free to be any religion you wanted to at the start of this. You were free to be any Christian religion you want. You could be Catholic, you could be Protestant, you could be a Lutheran, you could be a Baptist. Maybe you could be Jewish, but you certainly couldn't go, go, be, go be a Muslim or a Hindu or any, any of that stuff, okay? That's going to be later. But this is still much more tolerant than most of the world was, okay? All right, so let's look at our movement towards unification because England had had a policy of divided control. They intentionally kept our colonies weak by dividing them up into 13 separate colonies, each with their own governor and no cooperation between them. England's big fear was that the colonies would start to cooperate. Why would that be? Yeah, just, just think about a map. Little bitty England is an island over there, and it's ruling this whole vast continent over here. What happens if this vast continent decides to unite? You're in trouble. And England knows it. So they intentionally kept, a, kept it divided. But it's going to start to break down. In 1754, Ben Franklin is going to uh, come up with a plan. Now, it's not going to work. But his plan was to unite seven of the colonies to create a, 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 an army to defend itself against the Indians and the French. This is kind of in the French and Indian War period, okay? So he's planning on uniting them. Now, the colonies didn't agree to this, but it's still a stepping stone forward because they're talking about it. They're talking about the importance of uniting, okay? That was Franklin's plan of union. In 1765, when Parliament passed the Stamp Act, remember the Stamp Act? Put a tax on all paper goods, and had a stamp put on newspapers, playing cards, all that stuff. Well, the Stamp Act Congress was called, and nine of the 13 colonies sent delegates. This is where that battle cry, no taxation without representation, came from, okay? Now, they're not forming a government, but it is showing that nine of the colonies are now collaborating. They're cooperating to form uh, a union of sorts, a Congress. 1774, the first real Continental Congress, it's called, a meeting of all 13 colonies, and they did all eventually show up. Rhode Island took a while. Rhode Island always takes a while. This was supposed to be a conciliatory meeting. They were really supposed to get together and come up with a plan where uh, war could be averted with England 
and we were just going to kind of compromise, but King George refused our plan, so we ended up having a second Continental Congress where we declared our independence. Okay? Mm -hmm. So you can see each one of these steps takes us closer to a unified government. The Second Continental Congress, which met in 1775, becomes the de facto government of the United States. That word de facto is a Latin word that means in fact. So it's not the legal government, but it is the government in fact. It's what's doing the governing, okay? This is the Congress that adopts Thomas Jefferson's Declaration of Independence and drafted our first constitution. Our first constitution was the Articles of Confederation, and it was terrible. It was awful. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about how bad it was uh, in a little while. That hasn't been said as bad as it was. We managed to defeat England in the American Revolution under the Articles of Confederation. So it was effective as long as you had your A-team in place. Think about it. The Articles of Confederation, we had George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton, Governor Morris, James Madison, John Adams, Ben Franklin. They're all part of it. Those guys, you could give them any kind of government, they'll succeed. Of course, when the revolution was over, they all kind of retired and they went their own way and they put the B team in. Oh, that's so And if you're a Dallas Cowboys fan, you know what happens whenever the second string goes in? Let's talk about the Articles of Confederation now. I mentioned to you that it was a bad document, and this is, this is where we'll stop today is at the Articles of Confederation. But why was it bad? First off, it had no separation of power. There was only one branch, Congress. That was it. There was no president. There was no court system. We had Congress. As a result, there was nothing to check Congress's power. That's never good. They could act like a, like a tyrant. Uh, second, Congress was unicameral. That means one house. Anytime you see uni, like a unicycle, it means one, and cameral means house. So all they had was Congress. See, we have a bicameral legislature today. We have a house and a Senate. Two house. They only had one. And every state had the same number of votes. Well, that sounds fair to me. I mean, hey. Seventh and eighth grade are released for lunch. I despise that bill. It sounds fair that all the states would have the same number of votes until you realize that nobody lives in Rhode Island and a few hundred thousand people live in Massachusetts. It's not really fair. Your population centers run the same. Uh, so, in this system, your small states actually had more power than your big states per person. Third, there was no power to tax. None. The federal government could not tax you. Your states could tax you, but your federal government couldn't. The only way the federal government could make any money was they could sell property or they could ask the state to send them money. And they sold a lot of property, and that worked. They asked the states to send them money. None of the states sent them money. Okay? They were still thinking of themselves as 13 separate states, not as one country. There was also no standing military under the Articles of Confederation. We sent them all home when the war was over, and, and we just kept the, uh, the militias in place, uh, which was there if we needed them. The thought was, if anybody attacks, we'll call up the volunteers. And I understand why they did it. These guys were smart men. They, they studied history. And they know in the past that when you had a standing army, generals almost always overthrew the government and made themselves kings. It had always happened. So they didn't want that to happen. So they sent the army home. And I guess it's a good thing, because we didn't have any money to pay them anyway, because we didn't have a tax power. Okay? But, if we had been invaded again by England, we'd have been in trouble because we had nothing to defend us. 
Uh, there was no court system. No court system at all. There were state courts, no federal court system. So they couldn't rule a law unconstitutional. Again, no chief executive, no, no president, no power to regulate commerce. That means business between states. They couldn't regulate money. Every, every state was making their own money. So every time you crossed a border, you would have had to change your money out. They couldn't regulate how much a gallon was or how much a pound was, how, how big an inch was. So in every state, this would be different. Can you see how this, this would be very difficult to do anything with? Uh, states could put taxes on other, other people coming in. They couldn't stop it. So when you went into Rhode Island to buy something, if you weren't from Rhode Island, they could charge you a bigger tax than other people. It was a real issue, okay? All of these weaknesses are going to cause us to need to change this government. And there's going to be a move for revision. And we're going to talk about what was really a second uh, revolutionary war. We're going to overthrow the government and write a new constitution. But we're going to do that in the next election. So we will stop there for the day.